It's been 20 years since the United States and a handful of allies invaded Iraq in March of 2003. The following years would herald in decades of violence, instability, and economic decline for the country. The Iraq War killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and over 4,000 U.S. service members. It gave rise to groups like al-Qaeda in Iraq and ISIS, and it cost billions in U.S. taxpayer dollars. But what happened on the ground in the weeks and months that followed the invasion? Paul Bremer was appointed by then-President George W. Bush to head the Coalition Provisional Authority, the temporary transitional government established just after the invasion. He held the post from 2003 to 2004. Mr. Bremer, I want to thank you for joining me on Up Front. Thank you. You arrived in Baghdad to lead the CPA uh, less than two weeks after President Bush uh, stood in front of a banner and declared mission accomplished on board an aircraft carrier uh, in the Pacific. Over the next 13 months, uh, while you were in charge, Iraq, now effectively a lawless state, was seeing the rise of a violent insurgency. Uh, there were the now infamous, really, uh, revelations about torture in Abu Ghraib. Right. Uh, there were billions of dollars in reconstruction funds allegedly squandered or misplaced. Uh, all this happens in just over a year. Uh, in a recent article, you wrote that when you arrived in Baghdad in 2003, you found very different conditions than what Washington had prepared you for. Uh, how big was that disconnect? H how unprepared were you for what you encountered? My job directly from the president was to help the Iraqis get on the path to representative government, that was the political objective, hmm. and try to get the econo economy going again. It had been under incompetent uh, direction by Saddam Hussein and his cronies and also under UN sanctions. And I would argue, and I, I will argue, that given those two tasks, we actually had quite a lot of success in the uh, coalition provisional authority in the next 14 months. When we left Iraq, uh, they were already on the path for representative government, and the economy was substantially stronger than it had been when we arrived. Let, let, let's, let's, let's talk about some of the policies, uh, your specific policies and some of your specific decision-making. In May of 2003, you ordered the dissolution of the Iraqi uh, armed forces uh, and security forces, which effectively left uh, the country lawless. It also left 350,000 people uh, without jobs, many of whom were uh, well-armed and well-trained. Uh, help me think through, help me understand your, your thought process with that. What, what, what drove you to that decision? Well, you got to go back. Um, effectively, what, what had happened was the uh, army self-demobilized, which was the term that the Pentagon used. What does that mean? It meant they all left. General Abizaid, who was the com deputy commander of the forces, said there was not a single unit of Saddam's army left standing to arms anywhere in the country. There was no army. The mistake was to say disbanding an army when, in fact, there was no army to disband. Now, the army under Saddam Hussein was a huge army. It was 700,000 men and soldiers. So the army was Saddam's primary instrument of control and had been for 30 years. It was disbanded. It was not there. And so the choice we faced was whether to recall that army or to build a new army. Some American officer, officers, American soldiers, had been talking around among themselves about recalling units or parts of the Iraqi army. But I wanted to ask you a question about the, the earlier point you made, uh, because at various moments, I feel like you've, you've made different sort of analyses of this idea of uh, disbanding the army. Uh, in 2005, you said, I think it disbanding the army uh, was probably the most important decision I made, and it had the effect of avoiding a civil war in Iraq. The old army had been used to crush Kurds right. uh, for, for years. Um, Right. How do you sort of make sense of that kind of claim while subsequently saying, hey, I n there was no army to disband? It seems that at various moments you've made different claims about that. No, I, I don't think that's correct. I, you, may be, you may be able to find some sentence that's not the same, but the concept all along was the choice I faced was do we recall parts of the army and start a civil war, because that was, was what was going to happen. Or do we build a new army? And it's an important point about building the new army that we agreed we were going to pay, and we did pay, a severance pay to all of the draftees. This was a draft army. 
we agreed to pay them all a severance pay, which we paid, and we agreed to put the officers, all but the top generals, uh, on pension, and we doubled the pension that they would have got under Saddam Hussein. So the argument that these people may have gone on, some of them may have gone on to be part of the terrorist or the insurgency, really, at that point, th that's possible. But if they did that, it wasn't because they didn't have an opportunity to take their money and go set up uh, a business. They could start a newspaper or a television station. There were 100 newspapers in Baghdad within two weeks of my arrival. Everybody was out saying whatever they wanted to say. There are U.S. military personnel uh, on the ground in Baghdad at the time uh, who look at it a little bit differently. Uh, they noticed an immediate shift in public behavior. Uh, Colonel Alan King, when he reflects on the situation, of course, he's the head of uh, civil affairs, he said, the insurgency went crazy. This is after your decision. Uh, when they disbanded the military and announced we were occupiers, that was it. Every moderate, every person that had leaned towards us was furious. There were also protests with thousands of Iraqi soldiers. Some threatened to launch suicide attacks unless they were paid wages. I mean, there's a way that the very thing that you were trying to avoid seems to have been intensified through this choice. I mean, when you were... No, no. It, 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 uh, first of all, the demonstrations that you're just referred to stopped as soon as we announced the, the, the pensions, which was about two weeks uh, into June, maybe late June. But the pensions is just one part of it. There's also the let question... Me, let I, me finish. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that, that we're, we're on the same page here. I, I'm thinking specifically about the idea that you are now being viewed as occupiers, that now those moderates who are key to maintaining peace are now also becoming uh, angry and completely unreceptive to okay. the intervention. How, yeah. how do you... What about that piece Two of points. It? First of all, we were occupiers because that's what international law and the United Nations... Uh, uh, decision, resolution, identified the United States as the occupying power. I didn't think that up, and I, don't, I never liked the word, the idea of being an occupier, but at, that was the legal dis, uh, definition of us. Right, but this isn't a legal issue. The, issue, the question is, when, once you disband the military, it's no, longer, it's no longer viewed by the public in the same way. Now you look like an occupier. That's the point, is, is that it changed the, the, the energy on the ground. The, 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 if, if soldiers joined the insurgency, they did it, you know, out of, out of concern for the fact that we were going to produce a decent, modern army and that we were helping the Iraqis to change their political system so they could choose their government. Colonel Paul Hughes of the U.S. Army, he, he also reflected on this decision. Uh, he was an aide to your predecessor, of course, Jay Garner. He said, we changed from being a liberator to an occupier with that single decision. He said, by abolishing the army, we destroyed in the Iraqi mind the last symbol of sovereignty that they could recognize, and as a result, created a significant part of the resistance. And again, as we saw, that eventually splintered into these various factions, these various groups that eventually became the Islamic State. Uh, in retrospect, would you not have done anything differently? No. Uh, the, the mistake that I made was not announcing the uh, retirement plans, the pension plans, at the same time as we said we're going to build a new army. Uh, we, we delayed that for two weeks, during which time there were demonstrations by ex-army. Uh, and as soon as we announced the uh, decision to pay double the pensions, the demonstration stopped outside the green zone. It, it directly stopped. Just before leaving office, you signed a decree uh, which granted the U.S. and other Western contractors immunity from Iraqi law, uh, including criminal prosecutions while performing uh, their jobs in Iraq. In 2007, guards uh, from private security contractor Blackwater uh, opened fire into oncoming traffic at the busy uh, Nasorda Square's intersection in Baghdad. They killed 17 Iraqi civilians, including children, uh, and they injured 20 others. According to eyewitnesses, uh, including other Blackwater employees, uh, people were gunned down as they attempted to flee the shooting. Uh, the Iraqi government was unable to prosecute them because of this immunity decree. Uh, the guards who were eventually sentenced by the U.S. federal court were given pardons by President Trump in 2020. How much of the blame for this level of impunity lies in the order that you signed? Uh, I, I don't know the. I don't know the. I, I didn't follow the court case. Obviously, the Blackwater uh, uh, 
attack on these people or response to their attacks was outrageous, and completely uncalled for. And uh, I, I would certainly not, and I did not support them uh, being let off. I, I think that was a mistake. Would you have supported the Iraqi government uh, having the legal power to... Well, the, the, the order actually was replaced by a uh, negotiation between the United States government and the Iraqis about the whole question under which provisions we would provide uh, security. We, we have arrangements like that in other countries where we uh, have soldiers. For example, I lived in the Netherlands for some years. We had American soldiers there. And they were always, as part of the agreement, bilateral agreement, the question about how far American law would reach to those troops is always a matter of negotiation, as it was after I left Iraq. There was no sovereign government at that time. Right. But, but, but the question is, they were immune under Iraqi law because of this decree. Was it a mistake to have that decree? No. The decree only was in effect during the time of the occupation. It was replaced by a, an agreement between, a bilateral agreement negotiated between the American and the Iraqi government to cover American military and forces that were there later. So, so it didn't, it didn't. It was, it was So you have no regrets on signing this order? I'm sorry? You have no regrets about this order no. at all? No, no. Mr. Berman, it's a pleasure having you on Upfront. I want to thank you for your time. Good to see you. Absolutely. Everybody, that is our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.